Good evening, everybody. This is Jackie Lukeman. And I'm at the Shahid Lukeman. And this is Live in Lukeman Nation, the most threatening show on the internet. Why? Why would I say that about Lukeman Nation, especially Live in Lukeman Nation? Because knowledge is one of the most threatening things we possess right now. That's what those in power don't want us to have. That's why they miseducate us with all of the bells and whistles of the media. That's why media companies have been allowed to conglomerate the way they have. That's why the FCC no longer allows community control of radio stations. That's why CNN has to produce uh, uh, an advertisement mm -hmm. basically promising you that they're telling you the truth because they know that they're not. So what we give you here in Lukeman Nation, the only currency that we have here in Lukeman Nation is the truth. And we give it to you strong, we give it to you black, we give it to you hot. We are the most threatening show on the internet. Welcome to Live in Lukeman Nation. Man, we got a lot of stuff to talk about. Yeah, well, first of all, I wanted to know, um, uh, <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, let, we'll build, uh, let you guys um, do what you got to do. Um, go grab your coffee, your latte, <laughs> your ginger tea. Ginger tea. And, um, you know, get your cheese and crackers and, Ooh. you know, do whatever you got to do. Take a deep breath because we're going <laughs> to go in today on um, some territory that we normally don't deal with, but we think we should. Um, one of the things that um, I have to really give uh, you credit for, Jackie, is um, the show that you had uh, Sunday uh, with, with Nina. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, it was you know. Look, I mean, what you guys talked about on that show that day, I mean, was just so. I mean, it just touched me. Even though I I didn't host that day with you, I wasn't uh, co-hosting with you, but of course I was in the studio. And um, wow, I just have to say that um, you know, you and Nina uh, really touched me on oh. um, you know what you guys shared um, on the show. Well, I, I appreciate that. Um... And, and, you know, like I said, uh, Sunday, um, you know, we wanted uh, uh, Anoa to be on, our friend, our sister, our sweetheart, Anoa Shanga, to be on. But, you know, life happens. So she couldn't be on, on the show Sunday. And, uh, but we really, I really appreciate Nina Marks uh, being on and the conversation we had. And uh, this is my little shout out to my husband. I did it. Sunday, but I got to do it again. Um, and my husband understands the delicate nature of these kinds of con conversations, right? You know, being a black man, he's got to have space with other brothers to, to have those conversations that are delicate where they can just express themselves and I don't need to be around. So I appreciate, I really appreciate that he um, respects that concept of 
being safe in, in order to just have a conversation and say what you got to say without me needing to be there. So I really appreciate um, the space you gave us Sunday and just kind of hung Thank out, you. you know, in in in, a, in another room until it was time for yeah, me to well, wrap I appreciate up. That. Thank you. So I am going to share a little bit while I talk to you guys about just a few things because what we really want to talk about is U.S. imperialism in Africa, but we can't ignore the current events. No, we can't. Right? Because our name is Coffee, Current Events, and Politics. Hey, could you do me a favor? Yes. Um, there's people that come on our page, we mm -hmm. post certain stories, uh -huh. and they, you know, and, and we get a lot of flack for that. You know, and um, could you please explain? Because maybe maybe it, it, it'll, it'll sound better coming from you. Could you please explain what we are about, what what we stand for? What does Lukman Nation stand for? Um, well, I just told you that the only currency in Lukman Nation is the truth. What we don't do here is um, cater to anybody's opinion. We don't cater to anybody's preference or anybody's perspective. The truth is what it is. And sometimes it's not comfortable. Sometimes we don't like it. Um, but we talk about it anyway. Sometimes we don't agree with the viewpoints uh, on, a, on a whole of everybody that we talk about or highlight on this show. We don't agree with every issue. But there are some things that need to be said. So when we talk about current events, um, and, and if those current events happen to involve the DNC or Hillary Clinton, like I've said before many times, I'm tired of talking about Hillary Clinton, tired of talking about her, and I'm tired of talking about Bernie Sanders too. At the same time, when there is a current event mm -hmm. that happens that is surrounding those people, yeah, we're going to talk about it. We're not going to make a big, huge deal about it because at this point, None of them are a big, huge deal. Exactly. Not, not, not from our perspective. But we can't ignore uh, the issues that arise because of these people's involvement, right? So, so that that's not what we do. We don't. We're not here to um, get likes, right? And and you know views. It, we would love to get to be to, you know to to do a show and have hundreds of viewers. That, but that's not our goal. Our goal is giving the information. Now, if you want us to have a bunch of viewers, then you need to share our videos. You need to share our streams, exactly. like right now, share this stream. Um, but we're not going to not talk about a story or an issue that we think is important mm -hmm. just because it's not a part of a narrative that some people think we should be focusing exactly. on. Um, again, for the third time now, the only currency in Lukman Nation is truth. I, we're not here to um, prop up the latest online progressive conspiracy theory. We're, we're not here to, um, uh, to be fans of the latest political star. Yeah, the, I always call no. it the fan of the latest political football. They <laughs> down the yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, that's not what we do here. We talk about issues. I mean, and, and if I could say, Jackie, you know, this is, um, our show is where adults come to have adult conversations. Hmm, say you that know, again. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, you, you can go anywhere to be entertained. You can go anywhere, you know, where people are... Um, Stuck on, on uh, you know, they, you know, their their vehicle is stuck in the mud. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by stuck in the mud, I mean they just can't get out of the Bernie rut. Right. They can't get out of the DNC. And if that's what turns you on, then fine. You know, I mean, you know, what's what's remaining of a free country? I'll let you have that. <laughs> but um, but you know, over here we have adult conversations, and we also have conversations. Uh, we're not just about having conversations, as many of you have seen in the um. Uh, uh, that Jackie and I, we participate. We're not just Facebook talking heads or, you know, as somebody said before, we're not just Facebook outraged. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know, we actually go out to, um, and, and we actually put our footwork um, to where our passions are. And, and, and what we try to do is to encourage our audience to do the same. Many of you um, uh, are doing that. But we try to encourage um, our audience to do the same. And so 
we're not, you know, we're not here to entertain and, and bells and whistles. I could be quite funny sometimes, but oh, he's we're not here for that. And um, so anyway, Jackie, um, this morning you was on Fault Lines mm -hmm. this morning, right? Yep, so I, I, was was on, I was on Fault Lines this morning. Fault Lines is on on the dubious uh, Sputnik radio network. And, and I, yes, I am saying dubious as I'm being sarcastic. Uh, because of all the furor now about mm -hmm. um, a, a, a black activist who we know right. who has been, who was just smeared in, in some piece of yellow journalism from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. We posted that article um, trying to tie uh, the um, black female candidate, progressive Democratic candidate uh, in, in, in Atlanta mm. to Russia by mentioning that her former staffer appeared on uh, a show uh, called uh, By Any Means Necessary that is uh, the vehicle of another respected black activist, Eugene Perrier, which is on Sputnik Radio. Okay. Uh, okay, that, that's, that's it. That is the whole connection. So, yeah, I was on Fault Lines this morning mm -hmm. with Garland Nixon and Lee Stranahan. Garland, as we all know, hope you know, that Garland is a progressive Democrat, does his own show on our favorite radio station here in Washington, D.C., WPFW. He's also on Facebook. Um, and Lee Stranahan is a conservative. Yes. Uh, um, um, uh, talking head, I guess, and their show was on Sputnik, <laughs> Sputnik Radio. So I was on fault lines on Sputnik Radio this morning. So I guess I've been influenced by the Russians too. But we had a great conversation this morning about um, the purge in the DNC, mm -hmm. right? And and I was asked. I, I go on the show every once in a while. They have me on at like oh dark thirty in the morning. Oh dark thirty for me is like seven a.m. <laughs> and I, it, yeah, so I'm, I'm there with my coffee. So they asked me uh, about uh, what I thought about the DNC purge, mm -hmm. if I thought it was a purge. And I answered this morning, and I'm going to say the same thing now. I don't know what else you can call it. What, what else would you call it when the leadership of a political party um, dismisses people who are, are, who are either vying for leadership or who are... Uh, in leadership positions who are loyal to the insurgent populist wing of the party that you don't want to listen to. What, what else would you call it but a purge? Especially when we know that the Democratic Party, that the DNC does not want to um, move toward a populist progressive agenda. Right. We know that they don't because they just uh, 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 installed lobbyists as super delegates they're sticking with the super delegate system they are and some of those new super delegates mm -hmm. are lobbyists so these people like their money they're not trying to give it up they don't care they don't care what us broke people on the left they don't care and but see we we've known this mm -hmm. we we've always known this right we've talked about this um for quite some time here in Luke Mon Nation and and on other platforms so it's not a surprise to me um, I do believe, as I was asked this morning, that I think we have to be realistic right, right. In, in, in the way we approach what the DNC is doing. And, and I hesitate to say that as if the DNC hasn't always done this. This is the thing. This, this ain't new. Mm -hmm. this, is the, this is how the DNC has pretty much always operated since... The Democratic Leadership Council. So, I mean, so in what way uh, do you think that uh, the DNC is operating in the old ways that you're saying? Like, like you know, what, what do you think they're up to now? So, under the, 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 uh, the, the strategy of the Democratic Leadership Council, which is now a defunct organization, and uh, they, they, they disbanded the organization after the Democrats won the White House, pretty much under Bill Clinton. Clinton was the beneficiary mm -hmm. of Democratic, uh, the Democratic Leadership Council's strategy of intentionally ignoring policies that specifically affect marginalized groups of people, people of particular identity groups, 
like black people, women, gay people, immigrants, the disabled. Everybody who's uh, uh, every, all non-white groups. All non-white men. Right. That the Democrats joined the conservatives, the so-called better than the Republicans, Democrats joined the conservatives in demonizing the concept of identity politics. Okay. They did that through the strategy of the Democratic Leadership Council, and, and they did that because they wanted to win back the vote of, of, of middle class and working class white males who defected to the Republican Party. So they actively, through people of specific identity groups, off under the bus in order to win the white male vote. Right. That, that's what they did. And, and it's documented, not making it up. Yes, we'll provide the link for you. That's what they did to win the White House under Clinton. They're doing the same thing today. It is the exact same strategy. This is why you hear all this talk about big tent. In the Democratic Party, you know, oh, we need unity. You know, we, we don't want to focus on identity politics. They're doing the exact same thing. Right. They're, they're trying to make it seem like, oh, you know, well, look, we're especially since Donald Trump is as horrible as we knew he'd be. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's like we're not most black people are not surprised by Donald Trump because we've told you before we've lived under many we've he is just the culmination of what we told you this government has always been but white people are just freaked out because they're just like how could our government be so bad well this is how bad our government has always been to us but see people don't listen to us no mm -mm. so the democratic party can get away with with perpetuating this this myth of we're a big tent, you know, we, we're not two Americas, that stuff that Obama right, right, said in right. his, you know, speech. We're not two Americas, we're one America. No, we've always been two Americas. Actually, we've been two, three, four, maybe five. We've probably been 18 Americas. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's no, so, so, um, we, we are fighting now. Well, I shouldn't say now. We've always been fighting one system. We've always been fighting one political party mm -hmm. for for as long as and as, for as long as at least 1956, when W. E. B. Du Bois said that what we have is two wings of the same evil bird. He said that. He wrote that in an essay in the Nation magazine explaining why he wouldn't vote in the 1956 election. And the reason he said he wouldn't vote um, are the same issues we face today. But you know what really bothers me about this whole DNC thing? What, what is that? Um, what really bothers me about the whole DNC thing is the fact that certain people just won't go away. You know, I mean, we posted a picture that, a uh, 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 story about Donna Brazil, uh -huh. um, you know, because they reward their crooks. <laughs> they do. They I do. Mean, you know, I mean, you know, incompetency and crookdom <laughs> and all that stuff gets rewarded. So, you know, there was a story, Don, uh, Donna Brazil was given something, I can't recall what it was, but mm -hmm. she she hasn't went away. Nope. Um, we all know that Pelosi and the Mummy crew, they haven't went anywhere. <laughs> and, I mean, just this refusal for the DNC to um, um, they they're just anti progress. Yeah, that's why you can't call them. They're, they're not a progressive amongst them. Mm -mm. They're anti progress, and they just rehash the same old people. I think Jackie, um, the message that we're getting from the DNC is the fact that yes, um, Trump Trump had gotten all those white male voters, mm -hmm. a lot of the white female voters who lied to Hillary and said that they were going to vote for it. They went uh, to the voting booth. And, I'm with her. And, right. then, and then said psych and voted for Trump. <laughs> and so now well, it, it goes back again. How do we get those people back under our tent? Mm -hmm. So what black people, Hispanic people, and everyone else is told to do is we're just supposed to just once again be good sports. Um, like we heard during the election, um, uh, the last presidential election, those of us who um, weren't satisfied with Hillary, those of us who want to change, we were told, you know, look, look, just be a team player. Right. You know, just, oh, okay, just, you know, just shut up. We'll, we'll take care of that, but be a team player because we have to defeat the evil that's Donald Trump. Well, that wasn't good enough for, for many of us. Mm -hmm. And so now the DNC, like you said, Jackie's going back to the same playbook and saying, once again, black votes don't matter. 
Latino votes don't matter. Mm-hmm. Gay votes don't matter. Mm-hmm. Um, but white male votes do. Right. Um, you know, so um, that's the message that we're getting. Um, my opinion is that, and trust me, I'm not stretching out far here. That strategy is not going to work for the Democratic Party because, first of all, it's a racist strategy, mm-hmm. number one. Mm-hmm. The Republicans will always beat the Democrats when it comes to racist strategy. <laughs> yeah. They will always beat them on that. I don't care how bad Trump is. Because you can't out-racist the racist. You can't out- ra- out-racist the racist. <laughs> and what happened is, is that the racist, they already view the Democratic Party as being the party of the others. Right. You know, right. they already view them as that. So, you know, so the Democratic Party trying to play the game with, with what the Republicans are doing. Um, and like you said, Jack, it's not new. They, this goes back. So this whole thing of, of uh, getting the Reagan Democrats back home and all this other kind of stuff and, and trying to appeal to what they consider the white um, male working class vote um, is not going to serve them well. Um, it's, it's, just, it's, 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 stu- it's just stupidity. And I think that um, I'm done playing playing the games uh, uh, with the DNC. Mm-hmm. That's why I advocate for a third party. And, I, and, and I'm not even really happy about the way the Green Party is going right now because I haven't seen any um, um, uh, uh, effort on the Green Party, not locally mm-hmm. and not nationally, mm-hmm. to um, learn from, from this last presidential election. I haven't seen the Green Party... Become proactive in nothing. Yeah, you know mm-hmm. we already had. Um, we already know that there was a large swath of um, large percentage of black people who didn't vote in this election because they were not happy with the choices. They mm-hmm. didn't like Hillary. They and they definitely didn't like Trump. Mm-hmm. Um, and we know that that a lot of people felt this uh, um, uh, disenfranchised by that whole political system. Right. And the Green Party is doing nothing that I can see. Um, to to organize that large group of people mm-hmm. to make the Green Party um, uh, become serious and and uh, uh, and be taken seriously. Right. I, yeah, I haven't seen it. So um, I don't know if it's Green Party people out there, um, and, and, and and you know, let me know what's happening because um, I just th- I see the Green Party uh, basically rolling the dice every four years. Right. Right. You know, and um, that's not the way that you build um, um, any kind of political revolution in this country. No, I mean, there, there are some um, Green Party chapters mm-hmm. that are are uh, that are actually taking advantage of what's going on right now in Congress, which is, I think, a great segue to right. the next issue. But I, I wanted to but but enough Green Party chapters and, and members and and um, offices are not doing the work on the ground that they really need to be doing to mobilize, to organize, and 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 educate people about the Green Party as an alternative in order to mobilize. Um, and 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 it's not just Green Party uh, members either. I think this is true of all independent parties right now, including. Anybody who calls themselves a so-called progressive, even if you're still in the Democratic Party. Mm-hmm. And, and look, please don't comment when I just said that about, oh, anybody who's still a Democrat isn't a progressive. Listen, this is what we need to be realistic about. Everybody's not going to leave the Democratic Party. That's just the truth. When the Tea Party insurgency happened... They knew that everybody wasn't going to leave the Republican Party. So what they did was they started having these little town hall meetings. Right, that's right. Where like five or six people showed up and they started talking about what they wanted to see the Republican Party look mm-hmm. like. What did they want as an alternative to the Republican Party and how they could get that. And they started to gather more people to these little events. And the next thing you know, they were running people for uh, school board. They were putting people on school boards. Yep, and and nobody paid any attention to no. them when they were putting people on like the school board, when they were running uh, uh, candidates for the sheriff's right, office, right, you know, when right. they were running candidates for the recorder of deeds, you know, when they were putting people in these little um, insignificant offices. But then the next thing you know, they started running people in city councils. 
They started wanting uh, 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 candidates. For, they started getting people uh, who, who were judges to run for judgeships. That's true. Yep. Mayors. And yep. the next thing you know, they started having people run for mayor. And then before we knew it, they had people in Congress. And we're all sitting around like, where'd they come right. from? How they started that? at the at the very ground level. They started at the basic ground level. Now, there were some crazy things that people did. Like, right? Like, remember the lady... I can't remember her name right now. Who kept suing uh, President Obama to sh because you know to show his birth certificate? You you're always going to have people who do you know. But, but see, we, but see we call that crazy. But at the same time, just like with Trump's birtherism, mm -hmm. we call that trait crazy, and it is crazy to us. Right. But at the same time, it's like <laughs> the people who sus uh, ascribe to that Tea Party ideology that wasn't crazy to them. It right. It was not saying? like. I'm not gonna mention any names. I think it's crazy when certain so-called progressives want to dive into the mall waters and <laughs> take off their clothes and run bare naked in the mall waters. That's protest. <laughs> That's crazy to me. Yet when that person did that, he had like twelve people with him. And and and, and it's and it's like <laughs> and, and and I guess my point is if you got people, if we have people in this movement who are that charismatic. I don't understand why y'all aren't organizing to actually solve problems. Why aren't y'all organizing to push people to to canvas for actual candidates? I, this, you know, the kind of stuff that that people are doing now is, is, you know, we're still suing the DNC. I understand that that's a sexy hashtag. Y'all love that stuff. Y'all love the idea of taking the DNC to court and making them do right and exposing them for their evil in court. I'm not saying it's not going to happen, and I'm not even saying it doesn't need to happen. What I am saying is that for some of us, like we live in Southeast mm -hmm. D.C., as much as I would probably love to relish taking Hillary Clinton to court for her role in the crack ep epidemic, her and her husband's role in, 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 in flooding our neighborhoods with crack and guns, as much as I would love mass to take and mass incarceration, as much as I would love to take them to court over that, we have to deal with the fallout from that every day. So I have to weigh my options, right, with 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 the resources that, that I have. Is it more beneficial for my people right now at this moment to sue Hillary Clinton to prove that she was involved in this? So that I can make her pay, or is it more important or more beneficial to my people for me and and us and the resources that we have to be on the ground meeting the needs of the people and advocating for candidates who can use their influence and whatever political um, uh, position they can get in that ad advocacy to work more on behalf of the people. That that's it's yeah. like I think there's that that. This is the level, I think, of political maturity that is kind of lacking right. in, in uh, among some of us right now. I, and like I said, it, it's not unique to us because, the, you know, crazy lady from the Tea Party, she spent, I think, the whole four years trying to sue Obama right. and prove that he wasn't American. But what did that benefit? I mean, people believed he wasn't American anyway. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, these these kind of pony tricks are just what they are. I just think that, um, you know, I think that suing government right now, um, uh, I mean, if, if you're going to sue uh, government, let me let me rephrase that. If you're going to sue government, um, let's let's sue government. Let's sue HUD for its racial um, um, housing policies that they had. Mm -hmm. Let's sue the Department of Education about closing our public schools down all across the country and um, and propping up these so-called charter schools. Mm -hmm. Let's let's sue um, um, the EPA for allowing um, something like Flint, Michigan and up uh, and, uh, and contaminated water go on. People who live in Michigan should be suing the water department. Mm -hmm. So so I mean so if you're going to sue I think that it would be better to sue those who are really culpable and um, is that the word culpable? Culpable. Yeah, yeah. culpable. Mm -hmm. Culpable and um, actually making people's lives more miserable. You know, miserable. Right. I mean, if you're going to sue, um, let's let's sue um, uh, 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 these hospitals who are charging 
uh, five hundred dollars for a pill that costs two dollars to make. Right. You know, I mean, they, I mean, we could go on and on and on and on. I think that there's crazies on both sides, and I hate to sound like Donald Trump on this, but I think that there's crazies on both sides, and that that's okay, that's fine. But somebody sane has to take the wheel. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, we're going to uh, move on from this. But the thing of it is, is that, um, as Pam Hickey said, yes, momentum is the key. And we're losing the momentum. Before you know it, we're going to be back in uh, uh, the presidential campaign again mm-hmm. if Trump makes this. Yep. So we're going to be back into the, well, whether he makes it or not. We're going to be back in this presidential cycle again. Mm-hmm. Green Party people are going to be scrambling on who they're going to put up there. And I mean, and and all of this time is being wasted, right? And uh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, let, uh, let me Uh-oh. segue into this. Okay, yes, I want to segue into this yes. because we said we wasn't going to keep our audience long. I know. Um, so anyway, the other big story on uh, 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 the event story is is that there are some in the GOP who finally um, decided that their conscience just can't allow them. To be complicit in Trump's uh, 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 administration, <laughs> right? You know what I mean. That that Trump Trump is so bad, <laughs> and, and 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 he has disappointed us so much that um you know I have to let this be known publicly. Mm-hmm. Now um there there's been a lot of things said about Jeff uh, Jeff Flake's um, announcement and I mean his statement. Um, yesterday's public statement, uh, Bob Corker mm-hmm. also um, uh, went on record and challenging uh, Trump's um, uh, fitness sanity. for the office, his sanity, and all those <laughs> things. Uh, McCain went out on record. You know, I don't think that progressives that we should get all giddy about this. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's also um, a movement now. Jackie and I saw this the day we were at the gym. Yes, we do go to the gym. Yeah. Um, so, and, and, you know, there's a campaign now to impeach Trump, very serious looking white man, you know, in the ad talking about how, um, he's an American citizen and we need to take the reins from government and, um, basically saying that, um, Trump got to go. Uh, Jackie and I had a conversation about this this morning. First of all, we don't need, you know, um, how do we know once again that we're, not being duped as a pop as a citizenry. Hmm. How we know we're not being duped because it's easy to say, "Oh yeah, finally somebody understands Trump got to go." And and it, and this is a very nice looking ad. This wasn't done on camera uh, on cell phones. This was a nice ad, hmm. uh, you know. So so this this is money behind this. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, well, okay, now um, should we jump on this right now, or you know, should we be critical thinkers? And and say, oh, wait a minute now. What are they setting us up for? Right. Are they really setting us up for, and, and Jackie and I hate conspiracy theories, but <laughs> are they setting us up for President Pence? Ooh. Ooh. That's, I'll just put it out there. I'll just put it out there. Ooh. See, I, I mean, I, I I am, when I when I heard Bob Corker uh, and, and, and read the things he said about Donald Trump, I mean, that they were funny. The whole, you know, adult daycare in the White House thing. Oh, just funny and priceless and a lovely hashtag. And and uh, um, Jeff Flake's speech was, oh, just so inspiring. And, and you know, how he talked about, uh, uh, you know, the need to, to return to decorum. And, and, and he said some great things in his speech. And Bob Corker is uh, courageous to stand up to Donald Trump, knowing how he is, uh, and to stand up against uh, the complicity or the silence of the entire GOP in in just you know mm-hmm. going along with it. That's right. At the same time, um, number one, I have to say that it bothers me how and 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 we really appreciate Dr. Jason Nichols for live streaming about this point that we shared on our page uh, yesterday, I think, or today. Listen, because I agree with Bob Corker and and um, uh, Jeff Flake, it does not mean I, I support their policies or I like them as people and I want to have them over for dinner now. I, I just agree with something they said. I still don't agree with their policies. But 
I mean, I can I think I can agree with the fact that they have told the truth about the behavior of this current president and still like not be a uh, quote unquote sellout. I know some people don't believe that, but seriously, some of us need to grow up so, yeah, and, so, yeah. and learn some nuance. Thank you, Dr. Nichols. <laughs> it's just crazy. Um, at the same time, they talked about his behavior. They don't have a problem with his policies. Right, that's right, that's right. They're see, not at all. Yeah, see, see, this is why, just because, okay, fine, they told the truth about Trump being, you know, a basket case, wackadoodle, just a mess. That's true. But, but they didn't really connect his horrible offensive behavior to his horrible offensive policies and his horrible offensive and destructive policies. So while I agree with their their assessment of Trump as a person mm -hmm. and how he is conducting himself in the White House, um, uh, in the People's House, sorry, that's going to take some getting used to, um, and, and, and uh, uh, that they are also very clear on not calling out much objection to his policies. So that does not make them like the darlings of the progressive movement. Somebody, I saw where somebody uh, tweeted, oh, yay, Jeff Flake. That's right. Welcome to the resistance. Get the heck out of here. Oh, come that. on. That's far oh, from being. God. Oh, come on. <laughs> and, that, and, and see, that's the thing I'm talking about. How easily, like Kier just said, um, and I agree with him. He said they are still GOP scum, but I respect their stand on this issue, um, even though, I got a small screen here, even though it's probably motivated by someone knows so. It's always, when you talk about our sleazy government officials, um, Pam Hickey um, basically brought up a good point too, which has um, been documented, is that he wrote a book and he sees that his numbers is dwindling and, you know, it's like, oops, I'm not going to win. Guess what? I retired. You know what I mean? <laughs> So, pardon me. So it's easy to be on, on, you know, it's easy to stand up when you have, when you know, when you have nothing to gain. Right. You know, <laughs> to lose. That's what I was yeah. saying. When you have nothing to lose, it's easy to get up there and say, "Yeah, Trump is a nut," <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, if he was running for re-election, I'm sure that that conscience that he found yesterday um, would be further in the back seat, you know, right. Uh, not right now, you know, right. that that type type of thing. So, I, you know, so I think that you're right, Kier. I think that when it comes to our government officials, um, they have been, they've shown that you can't trust anything from them. Even when they try to be sincere and when they try to be um, 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 passionate, I mean, you know, he even was able, and I gave him credit for that, he was able to get a quiver in his voice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I was like, wow, he got, he, very emotional. He, yeah, he got, he got emotional, that quiver. Oh. But, I mean, but come on, man. We're, we're talking about... Um, Elective officials who, in my view, um, uh, have no credibility whatsoever. You know, um, Corker, I think that Corker is upset because, I mean, it's a personal thing with him. It's not so much about um, how he really feels about, uh, you know, what Trump is doing around the world and in the country. He don't like being called little. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? He didn't right. like that and being, you know, they, these are personal things. Um, mm -hmm. I think the only one that I do have respect for is, is McCain's criticism of um, Donald Trump, even though he wouldn't call him out by name, but you know, but um, one of the things that, and again, I think that as progressives, that we should not sit back and, and wait for the GOP to implode as yeah. some kind of victory and say, well, hold up, wait a minute, the House of Cards is getting ready to fall. So, um, you no, know, no, nah, nah, we need to be um, um, at the job of building a grassroots movement mm -hmm. ourselves. Let the GOP do what they do. Right. They're in there now. Let them do what they do. In the meantime, we need to start building a grassroots um, uh, organization movement um, uh, so that, um, and it, it's not about just the next four years. It's really about um, um, uh, um, putting forth policies um, that uh, uh, people in, in, a, in a rich nation should be enjoying. Let's put right. it that way. Right. Exactly. You know? So, Jackie, mm -hmm. uh, wow. Um, so what's next? So, um, and, and it, the next story we're going to devote some time to because 
it's it goes back like everything in politics, right? Mm -hmm. Like everything in politics, there's a history behind it. And in order to understand what is going on now, you need to understand the history behind it. And I have to tell you now, you all now, please excuse my Captain America t-shirt. Um, <laughs> so, um, um, Sonia Steinbeister, uh, uh, Sonia, uh, I hope I'm not tearing your name up. Well, Sonia, she says she loves your shirt. Well, thank you, Sonia. Yeah. I, just, I just don't want people to be like, oh my, how are you going to be Pan-African and have a Captain America t-shirt? Because I because I got it from, what is that, five below? Yeah, it was $5. Five. It was in my size and I needed some workout t-shirts. That's and, why. And we are Americans. <laughs> and, we, we, never, we, never, we never not said we weren't Americans. And I like Captain America, the comic. That that's I'm also a comic book geek. So, um, But I, I we we got some clips from Democracy Now. Mm -hmm. I don't understand people. Some progressives have a problem with Amy Goodman. I, well, I don't know why. Okay, some progressives have problems with us. So uh, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I don't know why, but <laughs> that comes um, with the territory. That, that comes with the territory. But we listened to some interviews that Amy Goodman did on Democracy Now. Uh, in in uh, covering the uh, n the Niger story. And not just the, the story of uh, how a gold star widow has been treated, Mrs. Johnson has been treated, mm -hmm. um, and not, not even about how Representative Wilson has been treated, but we're talking about not this, even yeah. just the history of... I mean, this goes actually deeper than all that. This, this is so much deeper than all of this. It, it goes back to Libya. If you thought you were mad about the, the, about the Clintons' involvement in Libya and, and the Obama administration's mm -hmm. involvement in Libya, it, it goes to Libya. It goes to um, racial oppression here in America. And it involves you. So... Let me uh, cue these clips up. Let me make sure. Roll that bean. Right. <laughs> you did not just say roll. <laughs> roll that bean. This is supposed to be a serious moment. Okay, let's see. Because one of the difficulties for the United States in Africa is that it's very nervous about the presence of black people in the U.S. military. Because if black people in the U.S. military get in touch with the revolutionary forces in Africa, then it could create bigger problems for the United States of America. So the nervousness that we see at the top of the U.S. military in the White House over its relationship with black people was manifest in what happened with the um, Congresswoman and with Mrs. Johnson. And what we should be doing is to intensify the call for the dismantling of the U.S. Africa Command, and that every cent that is being spent within the U.S. Africa Command to militarize and destabilize Africa should go to reconstruction in Detroit, in the inner cities, and to provide water, health care, and education for people in the United States of America. Africa is very rich. Africa can reconstruct itself if the United States is not in Africa to ensure that the dollar is the currency of world trade and that African dictators send billions of dollars out of Africa to keep the dollar as the international. So, <laughs> Uh, he he began. That was a uh, professor um, Cooper, Professor Horace Cooper, Horace Cooper. Uh, who is, and he will actually be introduced in a, in another clip. I actually played them backward. I apologize for that. But he talked about the reason we are having in this country have such an easy time. Why this administration has such an easy time disrespecting this particular gold star widow. It, it, is, it is tied to the fear that the American government has had for decades, probably for centuries. Well, at least the, uh, since the Civil War. I so, yeah, in, in, in black soldiers who are trained, highly trained, by the most powerful military on the planet, their terror in those black soldiers realizing a connection not just to the continent of Africa but to the United States government's role 
in maintaining the destabilization of the continent of Africa and how it connects to the continued destabilization of African American communities here in this country. And I want to give a historical context on why that fear, um, uh, why that, how that fear has manifested itself in the past. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, and we spoke about this this morning, Jackie, where um, during uh, the 1930s, uh, the Italian invasion of Ethiopia, um, African American men wanted to um, go to Ethiopia to fight on the side of Ethiopians to oust the Italians out of the Ethiopian territory. Mm -hmm. Pardon me. And of course, the United States government um, wouldn't allow that to happen. Um, the United States government allowed uh, American, white Americans to go to Spain and fight in the Spanish Civil War um, or, you know, against the fascists. But, um, but black Americans couldn't go to Ethiopia to fight Italian fascists in Ethiopia. Um, a lot of these uh, black men were World War I um, veterans. Um, a lot of them had military training, and that's why they wanted to go over there. Um, but the reason why this is so significant is because Marcus Garvey, who had the largest black movement in this country, four million black Americans followed Marcus Garvey in this country um, in the early part of the last century. And so um, Garvey's movement ended around about the uh, about late 20s, 1930s. And so you had a lot of African Americans who were influenced by Garvey's teachings of a Pan-Africanist um, uh, uh, ideology. And, um, and so that was being manifested in African Americans wanting to go to Ethiopia and fight on the side of Ethiopia. The American uh, government would not allow that to happen. So, um, so again, um, what Professor Cooper was saying has its roots historically in this country of, uh, of black men, African American men uh, and women now um, uh, connecting themselves to the African continent and the skills that they have taught black Americans in the military as we have seen witness tragically in places like Dallas and in um, Louisiana when uh, American officers, uh, police officers lost their lives at the hands of American black servicemen who came home and didn't like what was go what was happening um, with police brutality and decided to take um, action against that. Mm -hmm. So when <clears throat> when we look at the history of U.S. imperialism uh, and intervention in Africa, <clears throat> excuse me, and we can make the connection between how the United States uh, continues to destabilize. Uh, regions in Africa and why they do it when we can tie that to why the Uni United States continues to um, perpetuate destabilization in black communities because make no mistake about it make no mistake about this Jim Crow everything that was done to us since we've been here was done to us with the intention of never allowing the black community in this country to coalesce and be a, un a, a strong, unified, healthy, vibrant community of people. There has always been a an effort to insist that African Americans have no connection with Africa. And there's always been this narrative that African nations uh, are as dysfunctional as they are because they're just backward and they don't know how to govern themselves. But when you know the history of United States involvement and imperialism, and not just United States involvement in African nations, when you know the history of many Western nations' imperialist involvement in Africa, you understand that it is that, that the dysfunction and the corruption that exists in these African nations is the result of the same forces of white supremacy and, and on a global scale, which is what we call imperialism and, and, and colonial, uh, mm -hmm. colonialization, that happens on the continent, it's the exact same stuff that happens with militarized policing here. So what's the connection? What's the history? What's the historic proof behind that? How about Libya? Let's talk about that for just a minute. This video clip is a little bit longer, 
Let me make sure it's the right one this time. Democracy Now! video yes. stream from Luanda, Angola is Horace Campbell, currently spending a year in West Africa as the Kwame Nkrumah Chair of the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana. He is a peace and justice scholar and professor of African American Studies and Political Science at Syracuse University. We want to welcome you both. Professor Campbell, let's begin with you. You're on the continent. You're in Africa. Can you respond to what has happened in Nigeria? and put it in a larger context of um, U.S.-Africa policy right now. Greetings from Luanda, and greetings to all the people who want peace. What is happening with the United States' presence in Africa is similar to the United States' presence in the United States itself. That is, the lives of African people do not matter. The United States of America is involved in a duplicitous war and terror in Africa, when on the streets of the United States of America, black people are being terrorized. At the same time, the United States is in a dubious alliance with France that wants to instigate ideas about terror in order to save capitalism in France. So this relationship between the United States and France in what is called fighting war and terror in the Sahel comes six years after the United States, France, and Britain went into Libya to destroy that country because that country wanted to create the basis for the unification of Africa and an African currency. Last year, President Obama said, that going into Libya was the biggest mistake of his presidency. Later, in October of 2016, the British Parliament had a report that said that going into Libya was based on lies. The only government that did not respond was the French government that mobilized those who are called al-Qaeda to fight against Gaddafi, the same French government that mobilized the so-called al-Qaeda forces in the Mali, in, in, in Niger, is mobilizing within the United Nations to get African Union, to get five countries in Africa, Mauritania, Mali, Chad, Burkina Faso, and Niger, to support France, to get the United Nations to send millions of dollars to so, to, in this so-called fight against terrorism. The challenge for us in the peace and justice movement is to oppose both the United States and France in this so-called war on terror. What the people of West Africa need is money for reconstruction, health, housing, employment, and changing the natural environment so that the millions of youth can get jobs. It makes no sense for the United States of America to be spending $100 million to build a base in Agadez in Niger, where France has already a military base, and France is using the United Nations in, so, in this so-called uh, multidimensional um, peacekeeping force in this so-called war on terror. What we need is for a massive campaign to get the truth about why these people are in Niger, Mali, and Chad, because they, there is no war and terror going on when they finance the so-called terrorists to throw, overthrow the government of Libya. Professor, Professor Campbell, if you could, you've talked about France and the United States and their role. Most Americans were not aware that there were this many troops, American troops, uh, in Africa. But could you also contrast or compare the French role and the U.S. role to China's increasing role? in Africa and the strategy that China is using as well? Well, in the case of France and the United States of America, both cannot compete with China. <coughs> in the case of Niger, Niger provides 75 percent of the electricity needs of France because it produces uranium. 7.5% of the world's production of uranium comes from a French company in Niger. In 2010, in 2008 2010, China promised to invest billions of dollars in oil production 
in Niger. The president of Niger at the time, Mamadou Tanja, had accused France of financing those who were called terrorists. He was overthrown in a coup d'etat. Both the United States and France and other members of the European Union are opposed to the Chinese presence in Africa because we're in a country like Djibouti. The United States has 4,000 troops. China has spent $5 billion building a state-of-the-art port and has spent $10 billion building a railway from Djibouti to the capital city of Ethiopia in Addis Ababa. There is no possibility of the United States of America and Western Europe competing with China in Africa. Africans do not want this competition over their territory. What Africans want is a demilitarization of the continent and for the duplicitous role of France, the European Union, and the United States to end in this so-called war and terror. The African people want money for reconstruction so that in a country such as Somalia, every cent that is being used for fighting the war and terror. I, so I hope you understand that that clip is a little bit longer, but we, we know we needed to cut it off. Um, we hope you understand now why you don't know that there are so many troops in Africa. Because th this is not about what you are being told. You're being told that this is about, you know, uh, uh, the, the United States fighting the war on terrorism or as, as they call it, the war on terror. <clears throat> some some uh, uh, jerk general said that it's about uh, teaching the Africans how, <laughs> how how to behave themselves or some BS well, like yeah, that. But they've been they've been saying that about Africans for centuries. Uh, right, right. No, no. What this is all about is looting Africa of its resources. That, that's what it's all about. It's, it didn't start with Libya, but Libya is probably the, the example that most progressives know about because uh, Libya was not uh, uh, invaded and, and Gaddafi was not overthrown because he was a horrible person, because he was a terrible leader. He was overthrown because he wanted to kick the EU and the influence of the Euro out of Libya. And he wanted to transfer the uh, oil reserves in Libya to an African currency. So you were talking about that earlier today. So explain some more about that so people can understand what that means. Well, first of all, let me say this. And, I'm, and this is the reason why we're the most threatening show on the, on the Internet. <laughs> let me say this. One of the things that I disagree with... Um, <laughs> Just did a boy. One of the things that I disagree <laughs> with um, uh, Dr. Campbell, and I can di disagree with him, even though he's a doctor and I'm not, is the fact that I don't even want China in Africa. Mm. Yeah, that that's. Yeah. I mean, China is just another colonizer, if you ask me. They may have a different way of colonizing, but they're a colonizer. Let's let's not forget history. African destabilization started when the Portuguese started kidnapping people and started the African slave trade. Mm -hmm. Let me repeat that again. African destabilization goes back 500, 600 years. When the first Europeans got there and they started extracting people and the African slave trade began. This didn't start um, just 30, 40 years ago. This didn't just start um, uh, uh, with, with Obama or Trump or anything like that. So, so Africa's been going through this for the last 500 years. The connection between them, and, and let's look at this. One of the things about the destabilization of Africa, as you had, had put forward, Jackie, is the fact that, it, 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 that the destabilization, let's look at the Congo. The Congo is the richest country on the planet when it comes to resources. Mm. Mm. Every laptop, every cell phone, every, all of these tech things that we use today, um, uh, the, the minerals 
that 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 these things use. I can't remember the name of it. Coltan. Coltan. Mm-hmm. The abundance of it is in the Congo. Mm-hmm. But see, white progressives don't want to talk about that. And I'm going to tell you why you don't want to talk about it. I was listening to a program today on NPR where they was talking about Boko Haram. That Boko Haram basically was formed because Western European and U.S. oil companies uh, 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 in collusion with the Nigerian government took all of the wealth of the oil reserves and did not give anything to the people. So Boko Haram formed. And Muhammad Youssef, who was the leader of Boko Haram, he said something has to be done. Boko Haram started off as a humanitarian organization serving their people. Really? And what happened was, is the fact that they were demanding that they would get more of the wealth of the oil, oil production that was happening in their land. They were not met with peace, but they were met when Muhammad Youssef got locked up by the Nigerian military, and he was murdered in their custody. Wow. Boko Haram became violent. Because when they murdered Muhammad Youssef, then the police started a killing campaign against Boko Haram members. And so Boko Haram had to defend themselves. When I listened to this today, all I heard was about how people were responding to the outside um, pressures that was put on them. What I mean is, they talked about Boko Haram, and then they talked about the civilian response to Boko Haram violence, but they never dealt with why Boko Haram formed in the first place. Mm -hmm. That's the problem I got with white progressivism. Mm. Because they don't talk about, they, it was like, well, what, how did the civilians deal with this? How did Boko Haram deal with that? But they never talked about why Boko Haram was uh, committed first. And the reason why you don't want to talk about it, like you don't want to talk about reparations, like you don't want to talk about anything else, because then you have to question what role you play in it and how you benefit. And that's the conversation that none of y'all are willing to have. Black people in America is destabilized in the same way that Africa is being destabilized. And the reason why the African Americans can't build nothing in this country is because that capitalism has to have fodder. It has to have somebody to exploit. And so the destabilization is created so there can never be an organized response to what's happening to, the, to, to those who are causing the chaos. Because if you have to worry about how you're going to feed your family, if you have to worry about how you're going to be uh, having a place to stay, if you're worried about not making enough money to afford the basic things, like how in the hell are you going to be able to organize against those that's assaulting your community? And then on the other hand, they flood it with drugs. It's mighty funny that in Africa, they can't get nothing to rebuild their society, but they damn sure can get the latest weapons. It's mighty funny that you could go to places like Baltimore and Camden and D.C. and you, they can't build affordable housing. They can't, they, you know, they can't create a, a viable education. They can't create none of those things. But damn it, the hell our kids have access to the latest weapons on the street. They have access to the hair. And see, but now the chickens are coming home to roost. And I know y'all don't like me saying this, but the chickens coming home to roost because the same destabilization... See, we had the crack epidemic. We still got the crack epidemic. But now y'all got the opiate epidemic. It's the same playbook. In history, the Chinese had the opium epidemic. Wow. They never changed their, their tactics. So the Chinese had the opium epidemic. Now the Afghanistan, the Afghanis now are going through the opium epidemic. But y'all still want to talk about the fucking DNC. Wow. I'm sorry for losing my temper, man, but we ain't got time for this. And so the destabilization of Africa, the destabilization of black people in America, and the destabilization of people around the world is the same playbook that they're using. And I'm going to tell you something, and, I, and I'll end it here because I know we're out of time, is the fact that if I was somebody that was from the other side and I was having drones dropped on my head, and I was having my village uh, uh, destroyed and, 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 um, and, and my fishing waters polluted and, and all of this stuff, and yet I look at America and y'all don't give a shit? Well, guess what? When it's time for me to strike back, ain't none of y'all innocent. Wow. Ain't none of y'all innocent. Mm. 
Mm. Because if I can look at the news and find out that there's nobody in America who opposes what is happening to me, then when it comes time for me to strike back, ain't none of y'all innocent. So we need to we need to to start thinking about how we going to rescue our rest how we going to send the message to the rest of the world that we are all down with this bullshit. So Jackie, I'm done. That's my rant. Ooh. You see, this is why we we have not had patience with and we will continue not to have patience with anybody, whether it's your favorite online progressives, whether it's some uh, high ranking official in the DNC. I don't care who it is who has a problem with identity politics. See, not caring about what this government has done, not just to black people in this country, but y'all haven't cared about what this country has done to black people in other countries either. And I, I'm not even talking about the stuff you don't know about that they don't tell you. I'm talking about the stuff you know, because you knew about Libya. You knew what this government did to Libya. And the only thing about it that mattered to you was that it made you hate Hillary Clinton. But did you connect the dots? You're on the internet. I don't even understand why. The, I don't, I don't, it, it blows my mind how people can believe the most ridiculous meme that, 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 that pops up on their news feed, but you are on the internet and you won't research it. People were passing around this whole list of, of Hillary Clinton's Horrible, horrible policy issues. And then they added Obama's to it too. But most of y'all didn't even do the research into what connects those issues like what happened in Libya where the United States government under Barack Obama, mm -hmm. under Hillary Clinton, colluded with the French to assassinate a world leader who was trying to unite African nations under one currency. Yeah, we talk about Russian involvement in our election. But y'all are actually sitting here pissed off because some black people got a radio show on a radio network that's owned by Russia and you talking about we're colluding with Russia. And at the same time, your government is spying on black activists still with COINTELPRO 2017. Mm. And you wonder why, and some of the very same people, well, we can't focus on only your issues. Really? Let me tell you what not focusing on black issues has gotten you. The same treatment Africans have gotten. The same destabilization. The same treatment we've gotten. The same destabilization. And now the destabilization is coming to a progressive movement near you. Because you didn't care about identity politics. Not when it came to us. Well, you know what? I think that's a good note to end on. So we're obviously, obviously going to have to talk about this issue some more. We because will. this this issue of the, the, the military, uh, the American military um, imperialistic destabilization of Africa as it connects to the militaristic destabilization of black communities and black movements as it's connecting to the military destabilization of the progressive and leftist movement in this country, it's deep and it needs to be examined. And, and listen, we, we've got, and normally we don't pay too much attention to this, but this is, this is how I know we're in trouble in this country. There are people who will go on Twitter and they will go on Facebook and they will yell and scream for 30 minutes about, an economic theory, and they will have hundreds of people on that stream. Mm -hmm. and, and here we are explaining to you why you need to give a damn about what happens to black people, why you need to advocate for people of color and people on the bottom, why our policies and our issues matter, should matter to you, and we got eight people watching. Because it's, right. it's two brown faces, right. you know, yeah. and, and the word Africa. Y'all don't want to talk about Africa because y'all don't think Africa has anything to do with you. Africa has 
everything to do but with that's, what we are facing but right that's now. That's why Jill, Gil Scott Heron said the revolution won't be televised. <sighs> because the thing of it is, and that's why we're the most threatening <laughs> program on the internet. <laughs> because we are going to tell you the truth and we're going to sit up here and we're not going to sugarcoat it. You know, we're not going to be, you know, like others with brown faces sitting up here. Um, you know, we're not diamond and silk. You know, we're not going to sit up here and, and, and promote white supremacy. Uh, 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 you know, uh, <laughs> chocolate faces that's promoting white supremacy, yeah. making everybody feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Nah, man, we got 500 years worth of grievances, man. That stuff got to be heard. You know, so um, once again, we thank you for joining us. Share this if you dare. Um, let your friends know that we're here. Patreon, uh, visit our Patreon account. Yes. Um, Luke Mon Nation. Luke Mon Nation. And um, you go ahead because you're better at that than me. <laughs> so thanks for joining us. As, as Abda said, join us again on Sunday at 6 p.m. Yes, we are on Patreon. We would love your support uh, as we move forward in completing our documentary, Baltimore After the Fire. You can support that effort through Patreon, Luke Mon Nation, L U Q M A N. N A T I O N on Patreon. You can find us on YouTube, Luke Mon Nation Coffee Current Events and Politics. You can find us on Facebook, Coffee Current Events and Politics. And we are on Twitter, Luke Mon Nation, the number one. Thank you very much for watching you all. Have a great evening. Be good to each other. Peace. <laughs>